It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome in to another edition of Musso at the box. LSU dominates Kentucky convincing fashion, 11 to nothing run rule victory to advance into the winner's bracket at the SEC tournament. They will face the South Carolina Gamecocks on Thursday evening from the Hoover Met. So we will get you a brief preview of that game before we get out of here. But we are going to talk an awful lot about just a, I mean, a dominant effort from LSU against the co-SEC champion Kentucky Wildcats. That game was all purple and gold, all Tigers from the jump. Hey, we'll talk a lot about what Luke Holman did. We will talk a lot about the offense, and we will talk a lot about if LSU is back because, y'all, that is how it is supposed to look for LSU baseball. And there's some caveats that you can go through with it, but there is one thing that is changing now for this team that I think lends you to look at it and go, okay, it's for real. And we'll get into all of that. So smash the like button if you have not already. Get subscribed up to the YouTube channel. Get subscribed up on your favorite podcast app. Follow me on social media. And let's get right into it. We will start with the run rule victory over Kentucky. The tone was set right off the bat, literally, of Michael Braswell in the first inning. Michael Braswell takes the third pitch that he sees in the ball game and just launches it to left field for a solo homer to get LSU off to a one to nothing start. Braswell's second home run of the year. You know, it's funny. We've talked a lot about him making that move to the leadoff spot, and it makes a lot of sense. Like, he he is the, the type of guy you want there. We've talked about what Jay Johnson wants in the leadoff spot, right? It's a guy who not only gets on base, but can get himself in a scoring position. And Michael Braswell has a on base well over 400. He's second or third, second or third on the team in doubles getting into scoring position. The one thing that he doesn't have that Jay likes is the power. Michael Braswell is a contact hitter. So to see him hit that ball over the fence like he did to open the game, it was one of those moments where it's like, oh, all right, go off then, Michael Braswell. If we're going to do that, then LSU is going to be set up for a lot of success today. And that they were. The Tigers, you know, uh, forced – Ended up loading the bases in that inning, but being able to strike out swinging to end it. And then it became the Luke Holman show. And y'all, Luke Holman on four days rest was fantastic. And Jay Johnson said something after the game about Luke Holman that I loved that I want to get into here. But let's run through Holman's line because it was incredible. Six innings for Holman, no hits. Six no-hit innings for Luke Holman. He walked the first batter of the first inning. And then you had an error on Michael Braswell later in the game and another walk, and those were the only base runners against a top five offense in the SEC. We have talked about this at nauseam this week, how LSU is pitched against the top half offenses in the league. It's like, it's, it's crazy to think because of where LSU's pitching staff was earlier, but it has just not been a concern for LSU pitching against Tennessee, Texas A&M, Alabama, Kentucky, Georgia, they've that's when they've pitched their best has been against those teams and that's the top half of the league and Luke Holman was no different. Again, 6 no-hit shutout innings, walked 2, struck out 7 through 100 pitches even and was was really good. It's crazy to say this because He threw six no-hit innings, but Holman, he wasn't even his best. Like It it wasn't even the best that you've seen him or that we have seen him throughout this season. And that's why I loved what Jay Johnson said after the game about Luke Holman, because it, it ties in, it ties into that. Jay, the way he described Holman, it wasn't necessarily as a, as a pitcher, it was much more as an out-getter. Give a listen. 
I think it goes a little deeper with him. I think there's always like some unique circumstances that goes into him as a cancer survivor when he was a little kid, you know? And so when you put in context a, a, a game you need to win in college baseball versus what he went through, overcame, I mean, it, it's not surprising, but his poise, presence, mound demeanor, focus level, maturity is probably as good as anybody else I've had. And, um, you know, obviously um, he, he's, he's the real deal. Like he's gonna pitch for a long time. And I love it too, because there might be guys that have more on the fastball or metrics or this and that. I mean, there's nobody that I think is as effective as getting outs as him. That right there at the end. Love that. And like Luke Holman's stuff isn't bad. The curveball's really good. The slider's good. The fastball, he got up to 95 today. I get it. That's not consistently uh, for him. It's, it's more 92, 94. But right there at the end. Jay says there, there may be guys with more on the fastball or better metrics, but there's no one more effective at getting outs than Luke Holman. That's the pitcher's job. We can talk about pitchability and velocity and all, all the things that everyone shines the light on in baseball today with it being such an analytic-driven sport. The job of the pitcher is to get outs, and that's what Luke Holman did on Wednesday. He got outs, big ones. When he wasn't at his best, but because he's, and, and again, that's crazy to say, and I'll explain what I mean by that momentarily, but he got outs and didn't give up a hit because he's just that effective. This is what I mean when I keep saying he wasn't at his best. Luke Coleman was at his best against Ole Miss. He was dominant. He was pounding the zone. He had strikeouts on three different pitches. Like, he was in the zone. He was in his groove. I thought Wednesday, Holman actually struggled with the slider. I, he just, it wasn't as crisp as, as you've seen it be. And I thought that that against a pesky lineup like Kentucky, they were able to really spit on that pitch and, and focus on the other. And it got Holman into some really deep counts. But because he's so effective at just getting outs, and he can do it in so many different ways. You've seen Luke Holman strike out 13 against Florida. You've seen Luke Holman strike out two against Alabama, but still get you into the sixth inning. He can pitch to contact. He can get outs. And that's what he did against Kentucky. And even looking at it and going, man, you know, he didn't really maybe have his best stuff. You look up and it's six no-hit shutout dominant innings from the guy. And that, that is pitchability. That is why Jay Johnson is right when he says, Luke Coleman's going to pitch for a very long time. The one-two punch you have with Gage Jump and Luke Coleman is arguably one of the best in the country. You would put it up against anyone else and feel good. And you're seeing that definitely down the stretch for LSU, and you're going to see it in the postseason. And it's the chief reason why when LSU pops up as a three seed in someone's regional, that one is going to be pissed, quite frankly, because... They're going to have to face either Gage Jump or Luke Holman at some point, most likely, that weekend. And that's it's going to make LSU a really, really tough out. So just a massive hat tip to Luke Holman. You know, I thought I thought it was kind of like a an outing you've seen Gage Jump have plenty this year where the pitch count got a little haywire on Holman early. He was at 75 pitches through four. He bucked, uh, you know, uh, bared down and got you six full innings. And did it on 25 more pitches. That's all he needed to do it on. After throwing 75 through four, through 25 in his last two, and got you deep in the game, stole you some outs, and LSU's only had to use two pitchers so far in each of these games. Four total. Like, you're set up good. You're set up really good to face South Carolina. And you're going to need pitching because that lineup is raking. And we will get to that um, momentarily. So, the Luke Holman show started in the first he wiggled off the hook around that walk, leadoff walk, and you let the leadoff guy on against Kentucky. That can get you in trouble, but he wiggles off the hook, and that was great. Ashton Larson comes up, starts the second with a double. Alex Malazzo turned in such a key at bat right here. It's one of those at bats that gets lost in the game that nobody remembers, but it led to a run. Larson doubles. Malazzo steps in and and he's he's trying to bunt like the call is sack bunt flipped the lineup over then he bunted it two pitches he missed them both uh 
You know, there were a couple balls mixed in there. So the count's 2-2. He fouls off a tough pitch, but then he puts the ball in play. And it's a slow dribbler to short. And even though the and because the play's in front of Larson, he can see, okay, shortstop has to charge on, onto the grass to make the play. It advances Larson. It's as good as a bunt. He didn't get the bunt down, but he didn't fail in the at-bat. He put the ball in play, advanced the run, and then Michael Braswell comes up, and on the first pitch he sees, grounds out to the shortstop, and you score. That at bat from Malazzo is lost in the game. That is such a key moment for LSU right there to extend the lead. Without that, you say Malazzo strikes out right there or pops up on the infield. Michael Braswell hits a routine grounder to short. You're looking at two outs with the runner at second. Instead, you have a run. So that's massive. It's a it's it's something that we're going to get deeper into it, but I just wanted to highlight it right there. That's a massive at bat um, there in that game. After that, though, in the second inning, I should say, Kentucky went to their bullpen. They put in Robert Hogan, and he just handcuffed LSU uh, for his entire outing. He was he was very good. They had a really tough time figuring him out. He's a heavy heavy, heavy slider guy, and he had it working. And it uh it, it really handcuffed the Tigers. He would leave the game, uh, you know, after the after the fourth inning. But I want to touch on the fourth inning because. When we've looked at LSU and we've talked down the stretch, one of the big things that has changed for them, they're winning tipping points in the ballgame. And they did that in the fourth inning. This was the tipping point of the game. Emilio Petre walks to lead off the inning. That's another um, That's another leadoff walk. It's the first batter of the game to reach against Luke Holman since the first batter of the entire game for Kentucky. So since the first batter in the first inning, Petre walks. You get the foul out from Burks, the ground out from Lopez, two very good hitters. The interesting thing with the ground out from Lopez is it should have been an inning ending, ending double play, but LSU was in a shift, and Milam could not get over to second base to help Braswell turn it. Braswell might have had an opportunity to step on the bag, take it himself, and throw, but there was no guarantee that you were to get the out, so he took the sure thing at first. But the shift cost you a double play and put a runner in scoring position. Vin Daly hits a routine tailor-made ground ball to short. That would have ended the inning, but Braswell booted it. And Braswell's been awesome down the stretch here. Like, he has really left the fielding woes behind from the first half of conference play. That one ate him up, and it put runners at the corners. It's a two-run game at that point. Luke Holman strikes out Nicholson swinging. That is the tipping point. He's on the ropes. The pitch counts in the 70s. You have a a double play ball that was erased by a shift, and then you have an error at shortstop. Bad luck. Didn't matter. He got out of it, got his offense back up to the plate, and while he didn't respond there, it, it, it kept it, it kept the momentum with LSU. That's the tipping point of the game that they won, and it's what they've been doing down the stretch. Hogan would leave the game in the fifth. Hummel would come in, and LSU really had no answer for him either. Um, he would throw two scoreless innings, the fifth and the sixth. You get to the seventh, and that's when Kentucky went to Neiman. He strikes out Larson looking, but then, then it got fun for the Tigers. Malazzo walks on five pitches. Braswell walks on five pitches, and you have first and second one out for Tommy White. You have a wild pitch and a 1-1 count. That opens up first base. You walk Tommy White. Jared Jones comes up, gets ahead in the count 2-2. Kentucky comes back, uh, excuse me, gets ahead in the count 2-0. Kentucky works it back to 2-2, and then Jared Jones launches a hanging curveball over the left field wall, just inside the foul pole. That was the only question. You knew it was gone. Was it going to stay fair or foul? It stays fair. Grand slam. And it was a huge moment in the game. Obviously, that put LSU up 6 to nothing. But it was a huge moment for Jared Jones. And Jay Johnson was asked about that. What that can do for the confidence for Jones going forward. Because he had been struggling. Yeah, no, it was important. And, um, you know, as soon as as soon as they moved up on the wild pitch pass ball it was like and even though there was a strike it's like okay they're gonna walk him and um the thing i liked about that is in a bases loaded situation there's not a lot of margin for error missing outside the zone 
and he punishes you when you're in the zone. And I, I thought his at-bats were good today. You know, I thought he was under control. You heard him talk about just trying to get something that was elevated and hit a sacrifice fly. Like, that's a lot of maturity. Because if I had a body like that, I'd be swinging for the moon. So, which he's done sometimes. That hasn't gone over well with me. But uh, really proud of him. It's a very mature approach, and it's it's why Jared Jones has taken the step that he has. It's it's what we talked about with him all off season was you know can he pitch recognition? Can that be better? Can you know the situational at bats for him be better? And right there it was, and it it, it rely it, it happens because all you're trying to do is see the ball up. And just drive in one. And when you do that, and you're big and strong like him, like Jay said, the ball's going to go out of the park. You don't have to. When you're Jared Jones, you don't have to try and hit home runs. It's just going to happen because you're a freaking man child. Like, that's how that works. And that's how it worked there. So credit Jared Jones. And credit him for being able to have that approach, have that mindset in that spot after what he had been through. Because I know they kind of scoffed at it a little bit in the post game about him slumping, but he was. Jared Jones, before that Grand Slam, was three for his last 25 with 15 strikeouts. That's a slump. I don't care how you cut it. I don't care how you define it. That is a slump. Okay? It just is. But to see him come through in that moment, that could be massive for him going forward because LSU needs him in the middle of that order. So I loved seeing that in that big of a spot when we've talked about runners in scoring position, all that to see Jared Jones come through there. It was obviously huge. LSU goes to Gidry in the bottom half of the seventh, gives up a little, uh, a leadoff single, goes strikeout, strikeout. You have a wild pitch and then a walk. So he loads the bases, gets in a little hairy spot, but gets the foul out, um, there, LSU takes a 7 nothing lead to the 7th because Stravinsky followed um, Stravinsky followed Jones's grand slam with a solo homer of his own. In the 8th inning, LSU, after a flyout by Jake Brown, goes walk single hit by pitch, Larson Malazzo Bra- uh, Braswell, and then Tommy White, just like he did against Ole Miss, first pitch he sees, opposite field grand slam. And now we'll talk about the heater that Tommy White continues to ride. This is an all-time heater, what that kid is on right now. It is, it is insane. Tommy White in his last five games is 13 for 23 with four home runs. Two of them are grand slams. He's hitting well over 550 in his last five games. It's, it's insane, and it's incredible to watch. And that put LSU up 11 to nothing, brought the run rule into effect, and I loved seeing Gavin Guidry really settle in after, you know, kind of loading the bases there in the, in the seventh. He goes uh, foul out, fly out, strike out, no three ball counts, dominant stuff, and LSU gets a dominant win, and they move on in the SEC tournament. Just awesome. I mean, just awesome stuff to see. And I talked about it right off the top of the show that I think there's something because LSU faced two teams that have their postseason locked up. They don't need the SEC tournament. They're in the position that LSU was in last year. So, you know, you you didn't see Leighton Finley for Georgia. You didn't see Colton Smith for Georgia. You didn't see uh, Poozer for, for Kentucky. They took a different approach. They pitched off. And you could say, well, maybe that leads to the offensive success. I say no. I think there are signs from LSU's offense right now that shows you this is for real from them. And that's why I say, yeah, they're back. Like, LSU's back right now. That's how it's supposed to look. That's LSU baseball. That's what you thought you would get from this team. What's the conversation we've had about LSU all the way back since November? LSU's strength was to be pitching. You have to replace a lot in the lineup, but you have really good arms. The pitching will carry you while the offense comes along, and when it happens, you could be looking at a really good baseball team. That was the conversation, right? What do you have now? 
What do you have now? And here's why I think this is sustainable for the LSU offense. First of all, they've won five straight SEC games now. Their longest win streak in that category all year. That should not come as a surprise. In their last three, they've scored 9, 9, and 11. And like I said, the pitchers they were facing, fine, whatever. But it's at bats like in that second inning where Alex Malazzo moves the runner and you manufacture the run. It's the station-to-station baseball you played in game one against Georgia. And then it's the grand slams from Jared Jones, from Tommy White. It's the production that you're getting throughout the lineup. Those things. You remember the conversation we had last year about LSU's offense all the time? And don't misunderstand me. I am not saying this LSU offense is anywhere close to 2023 because it's not. But they're starting to do some of the same things. A lot of y'all would ask me last year all the time, does LSU, they live by the home run? And they didn't. They just, they didn't. They hit a bunch of them. But LSU was an extremely versatile offense last year. They could score and beat you in so many different ways. And that's what you've seen from this LSU offense the last three games specifically. You've seen them manufacture runs. You've seen them hit one through nine. And you've seen not just solo homers. You've seen LSU mash the ball out of the ballpark with guys on base. It feels like the offense is finally here. Tommy White has been great. Jared Jones has had his moments. You're starting to see Hayden Dravinsky swing the bat. Ashton Larson emerge. Steven Milam has been great. Josh Pearson's doing his clutch thing. Alex Malazzo at the bottom of the lineup is moving the offense tremendously. When they're going good, the bottom is setting up the top, and that's what's happening. And when you combine that with what LSU's done on the mound, they look like a pretty darn good baseball team right now, don't they? And that's what we thought they could be when it finally came together. Can they carry it through the postseason? We'll see. But right now, they're playing really well. And I'll take you back to another conversation that we had. This was... It was after the Vanderbilt series. So LSU had lost that series at home. At that point, they had lost four straight conference weekends. And I sat right here in the weekend recap and said, look, it's not good right now. It's not over. Every team at some point in the year plays their best baseball and their worst baseball. And right now, at that point, LSU was playing their worst baseball. That's what we said. But there would be a time that they played their best. But what it was fair to ask is, would it be too late? And right now, LSU is playing their best baseball up to this point in the season. And we can now answer that question. No, it is not too late. They have locked up a spot in the NCAA tournament. And now what they're playing for is if they can get off the the three line. I still think they have to win the SEC tournament to do that. But what's more important is it looks like you're coming together at the perfect time. Let's see if you can go make a run. But we've answered the question. No, not too late. And they've put themselves in a really good position because of that. And I would just continue to say major salute, major hat tip, bouquets, all of that to them because they deserve it. All right, let's talk about the next opponent, the South Carolina Gamecocks. South Carolina is a really interesting team right now. I'll be honest. I did not expect this from them in the conference tournament. South Carolina had come into the SEC tournament losers of six straight SEC games. They had gotten swept uh, by Georgia and Tennessee. And that was after a series win over Kentucky and Missouri. So they were coming in not hot and very much on the bubble because of those six straight losses. And they've beat Alabama convincingly. And then today they fought, or excuse me, I should say Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, they fought hard and beat Arkansas. And they've done it offensively. 
This is a South Carolina team that on the mound is not great, so LSU will have opportunity there, and we'll talk about pitching matchups here momentarily. LSU will have opportunity at 4.99 ERA for South Carolina on the year, so round it up if you want to, five, whatever. Um, the, these stats actually aren't totally updated, I, I don't believe. Um, I don't know if the Arkansas game's counting into that. They gave up five runs there. So you will have opportunity in the way the LSU offense is going right now. You feel good about that. I will say what I've been saying. LSU will pitch well enough to win. They they will. They've reached that point. They have enough arms. LSU, I'm expecting them to pitch well enough to win. Can the offense continue this heater that they're on that we just talked about? I think that they can. And if they do that, they're going to win this game. Um, pitching matchups. LSU's it's it's gonna be it's gonna be Sam Dutton or it's gonna be Nate Ackenhausen. Ack was warming up in the bullpen on Wednesday, uh, especially in that fourth inning when Holman was struggling, but then they sat him down, they went to Gavin Gidry. So it would stand to reason that Ackenhausen could obviously go. And then if not him, Sam Dutton, but you look at the arms you have available. You have Thatcher Hurd, you have Justin Lore, you have um Fidel Uyoa, like I mean Christian Little. Christian Little has not pitched yet in this SEC tournament. Like LSU, again, they're going to pitch well enough to win. I feel extremely confident in saying that. Um, it's going to be a tough challenge because this South Carolina offense has been awesome in the SEC tournament. They've mashed six home runs so far, and that's the thing about South Carolina. This is just a powerful baseball team. Like, if they're mashing six homers in two games in that ballpark, that's a powerful team. And it makes it even more frustrating is that they play on a damn high school field when they're at home because they don't need the help. They're just they're just powerful. Um, Cole Messina is obviously the guy you have to watch out for. Cole Messina, uh, funky, Cole, uh, funky Cole Messina, as they like to call him, or Moose, he is on an absolute heater. Like, he's on a Tommy White-level heater in this SEC tournament. He is six for eight with three homers in two games. And he's driven in eight runs. The whole top of the order, really, for South Carolina has been very good in this SEC tournament with Austin Breeling, Ethan Petrie, that should be a familiar name, Blake Jackson, and then Cole Messina. So it's a very good lineup, but neutralizing the top, that's going to be key for LSU. That's something that Alabama couldn't do, and it's something that Arkansas couldn't really do uh, as well. So that's the main key I see for LSU here. If you do that, there are outs later in this South Carolina South Carolina lineup. It's not as deep one through nine as it was last year, but that top is still plenty good. And Cole Messina, as we said, has just been in fuego so far in Hoover. So uh, that's what I would look out there, look out for there. For South Carolina on the mound, the options there are pretty slim. South Carolina, they, they're like Georgia in the sense that they don't really have an ace, right? They don't really have an ace on this team. Um... You know, Eli Jones has started plenty of games for them in conference play. And on the year, he pitched Wednesday against Arkansas. You won't see him. Garrett Ganey has started plenty for South Carolina, or has started in the past, I should say, for South Carolina. You won't see him. He pitched Wednesday, as did Ty Good. Ty Good's got three starts on the year, but it really kind of entered the rotation late for the Gamecocks. He pitched on Wednesday. You won't see him. Uh, Dylan Eskew pitched on Tuesday in the SEC tournament. Now, he didn't go extremely deep. He didn't throw a whole bunch of pitches. Um, he, he threw 28 pitches, so maybe you could see him out of the bullpen, but I don't think you're going to see him start. Um, you know, they've used Matthew Becker already. They've used their best reliever, Chris Veach. They kind of burned him, 66 pitches. So I don't think you're going to see Chris Veach uh, here in this ball game if you're LSU. So if you're looking for starting options for South Carolina, I see two. Uh, one of them is Roman Kimball. He has started seven games for the Gamecocks. That's uh, third on the team, and he has not pitched yet. He actually hasn't pitched since Georgia. He got a start there, and it did not go well. He threw a third of an inning and gave up four runs and was lifted. A big problem for him is walks. He has more walks than innings pitched. When he's in the zone, he's really good. 40 strikeouts. In 27 and two-thirds innings, only 19 hits. Like, the opponent only hits 194 off of Kimball. When he's in the zone, he's awesome. The problem is, he's walked 30 guys in 27 innings. That's not a recipe for success against this LSU offense. That's definitely a guy you could see. 
Uh, Tyler Pitzer is another guy. He's got uh, 17 appearances and five starts. He has not pitched in this SEC tournament, so that's a guy you could also see potentially start uh, for South Carolina. I like LSU in this game, and I like LSU in this game an awful lot. I, I think LSU wins. I think LSU wins it fairly convincingly as well. I will be honest. This team... They look like they are just on an incredible tear. They're playing their best baseball. I love what I've seen from the offense. And against the bottom of South Carolina's pitching staff, I like LSU to put up a lot of runs here in this game on on Thursday. I think they will, and I think they win. So there's my prediction. Um, And I'm fired up to watch it, y'all. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting to talk about this team in this light and – they're giving it to you right now, and it's a lot of fun, so enjoy it because there's no guarantee that they go on a run in the post in the NCAA tournament. Can they? Sure. Does it look like they might? Yeah, but there's no guarantee, so enjoy it right now. Enjoy it right now, every minute of it. I know I am, and I'm fired up to talk about it with all of y'all. Thank you all for being here as well. Smash the like button if you haven't already. Get subscribed up to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Get subscribed on your favorite podcast app. Follow me on social media, and be here next time for more on Muso at the Box.